Hello folks, this is Mike DeBruzzo and I am putting out some information about veterinary behaviorist Karen Overall that I believe anyone who is in the dog training community should listen to even though there is a lot of information but I promise you it will be helpful if you believe that your livelihood or your rights are being violated in any way because of the force-free community. So please bear with me as I work my way through this. I have notes that you can go to just by going to a direct link. I use the domain name, just karen.exposed. That's all you have to write in the search bar. If you're interested in any of this, I will update this to put more information as needed and this is gonna be a little bit sloppy but I'm just gonna jump right into it it's if this is useful to you it'll be very very obvious um, I went to I attended a webinar that was hosted by Karen overall veterinary behaviors very very influential because I am a dog trainer of about 30 years. I believe I am very ethical, worked very hard to learn the profession like a lot of you out there. But before I was a dog trainer, I was a I worked as a licensed veterinary technician and I worked with research as a research as a research animal um, technician. And I also worked in, in small animal clinics. So I understand, I understand I was in the trenches doing research as a technician, but I also, in order to maintain my veterinary technician license within the veterinary community, I have to take continuing educational hours, which I maintain the license mainly because I also teach at a career school. I teach, um, um, students at a vocational school who are going entry level into the veterinary profession. And I also teach at the same career school introduction to animal training, animal training and, you know, animal grooming and, and, and other things. But the point I'm trying to make is, um, is I, I, I signed up and paid for a webinar because the veterinary community says, that if I give this woman money, I am going to become more intelligent and I'm going to be enriched with new information that's going to make me better, right? And more knowledgeable to help to help the public. That is not what happened when I attended her, her webinar. Instead, what I discovered is there's this whole world going on that... Um, professional dog trainers are not that aware of in the veterinary community where ethical, balanced trainers, just meaning, I don't really like that term. I just think there's dog trainers. I think all dog trainers that are effective are balanced dog trainers. Just meaning if you use reinforcement and you use punishment when necessary, you're a balanced dog trainer. Well, the webinar turned out to basically just be an attack um, unbalanced dog trainers and telling the veterinary community to not send your clients to them. That's the message that is that is told in the webinar. There was no new information and the information that was presented was completely misrepresented and, and false. And I am sure of it, I cannot see a way that she is not violating her own AVMA code of conduct. Which, um, I also cannot see how she's not violating guidelines set by the Fair Trade Commission. Now I'm gonna go into details. Um, I want professional dog trainers. If you, I've dealt with this for 30 years. For 30 years, well-meaning, ethical, humane dog trainers are argue, arguing with things that you should not have to argue about, about 
force free, you know, about being a humane trainer and not being abusive just because you admit to using punishment humanely in your training and because you admit to using tools that are the best and humane for the cert for a certain job. Now, what has happened through the years, which I learned, it's very similar to that old Aesop fable about the tiger arguing with the, the donkey about the tiger saying the grass is green and the donkey is saying the grass is blue and they take it to the king of the jungle, the lion, and he punishes the tiger, sends him to jail. The tiger says, why did you send me to jail? And he said, you should really know better to be arguing with the donkey that doesn't know what he's talking about. And it's just fruitless. And that direction Professional dog trainers who have been getting, their rights have been getting violated, have been taking that approach for way, way, way too long. It is not something, so when I present here, I don't want to, I'm not here, I'm, pre I'm preaching to the choir. I'm not going to be convincing anyone about what's reward and what's punishment and what's humane and what's not humane. Because I think those days are are, are, are really done. At this point... It really does need to be treated as a legal issue. If there's going to be any sort of movement in the right direction, is that's what we're really dealing with. And Karen overall, she is. We're not talking about Victoria Stilwell, who is you know just an, an, an actress, right, playing a, playing a dog trainer. You can argue that maybe she just doesn't know know any better. This is someone who is the editor in chief of the Journal of Veterinary Be uh, Behavior, the official journal of like all the countries where the where dog training tools are being are being banned. Um, it is if people go to school and they want to be a veterinary behaviorist, like this is what they're what they are reading. She is a publisher of a of a author of the Manual of Clinical Behavioral Medicine for Dogs and Cats, which is the recommended resource for practitioners of the American College of Veterinary Behaviorists. It's a recommended resource for veterinary behavior technicians. It is, she is a resource, like she is the resource for the veterinary community when it comes to behavior. And she's putting out lots of false information, misrepresenting scientific studies, even though she, we know that she knows better, she is even misrepresenting basic operant conditioning in these webinars and everywhere that she's teach. And this is someone who is putting out hundreds of, pres she's, she has had hundreds of presentations to the veterinary community. She is considered one of the most influential people in the dog world. In the webinar that I attended, she was just flat out without any evidence telling the veterinary community that if you send a dog, if you recommend a dog to a balanced dog trainer, which is just a dog trainer, instead of going to the veterinary behaviorists, or to like a force-free trainer, which is not even a real thing, as you're gonna find out, they're just as much punishment as anyone else. It's just in her pipeline to her community that they're more at risk for euthanasia. They're telling the veterinary community that there's like proof that if you send dogs to balanced dog trainers, they're more at risk for euthanasia. If you send, let me see, dogs who delay seeing the specialist because they saw a trainer who uses forceful techniques can worsen and may be more at risk for euthanasia. And dogs who see specialists but are also try, even tried balance training become worse and more at risk for euthanasia. She is not, she's saying things like this in this webinar to the community. This is, this is not even, this is not even legal what she is doing, what she's doing to a whole profession. It's definitely against her code of conduct. Um, talking about 
Um, any trainer that uses, look what she says about prong collars, right? And this is not about if you prefer to use a prong collar or not, is first we have to agree, this isn't an argument. You can use a prong collar because for humane reasons, you believe it is the right choice for the, for the animal. It's the best choice for the training plan. According to her, if, um, if these veterinarians and veterinary technicians are asking about a prong collar, this is the kind of answer that they are, that they are getting. Um, prong collar equal to shock collar. Interesting question. Very, 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 very much depends on the dog. Um, your relationship with the dog is not the same with a prong collar and a shock collar because with a prong collar, your only intent is to hurt the dog. And I know that that's not how people think about it, but it is what happens and it's why they have scars and why you can have mucopurin lesions. Um, and the second... So we don't even need to talk about it. It's just false, right? Let's not talk about arguments anymore. It is false, misleading information. So if there's a dog trainer out there that one of the tools that he uses or she uses is a prong collar, that is the impression that she is teaching for continuing education hours to the veterinary community. This is the information that she is putting out. I listed that's just one of the things. I mean, it's like I say, bear, bear with me here. I'm not going to cover everything because there are some notes and anyone could ask, ask me questions, but I just, I just went through the code of conduct for, you know, for those who have a, 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 a veterinary license. And it, I felt like I was highlighting like every single, every single line. You know, um, she's, there's definitely conflict of interest, which, um, that she there's there's just conflict of interest because yeah she's definitely making money off of telling people not to go to trainers and sending people through a pipeline which leads to her and to go to dog trainers which also are going to get their continuing education hours by attending things that she does there's um Veterinarian should consider potential. I mean, you, you could, I'm not going to read through all of these, but it's very, very obvious. You know, veterinarians must be honest and fair in their relations with others. And they should not engage in fraud, misrepresentation or deceit. Like it's very, very um, clear with her. There's advertising by veterinarians is ethical when there is no false, deceptive, misleading statements or claims. A false, deceptive, misleading statement or claim is one which communicates false information or is intended through a material omission, which we're going to see further on, to leave a false impression. These are all things that's in, you cannot, it's not even an argument. It just is. Like this is Karen overall. Um, they should comply with the applicable law and guidelines, such as the Federal Trade Commission. Like where, it's not an argument at all that you're allowed to falsely misrepresent a whole profession and tell your colleagues and those who have direct line to your potential clients to falsely misrepresent because she's in a position of authority and is supposed to know better of which you are with the intentions to keep clients away from you so they come to her all right and this is it's um it's she's she's clearly violating things um she clearly grossly misrepresents. Now, I'm going into, I'll go into a little bit of this webinar just so you can see the extent of this. The very first slide in her webinar, that it was titled Understanding the Damage and Effects of Punishment, the Case Against Force and Shock. So notice it's damaging the effects of punishment. So now she should know better and we're taught we should be learning the truth. She's completely just manipulates operant conditioning so it could fit the message that she's trying to that she's trying to say. And this is someone who there's no excuse for her to make a mistake. She's an editor in chief of of the of the veterinary of, you know of of the veterinary behavior journal whatever. So right away on the first slide she's trying to give an example of what punishment is and what reinforcement is. And let me see like one of the first things that she said is she's given um, 
she showed she, she she gave the example in her slide that not petting a jumping dog or when attention is withheld from a dog to discourage an undesirable behavior is classified as using negative reinforcement. Everyone knows that every, even on the high school level, when I'm teaching classical con operant conditioning to high schoolers that are learning about operant conditioning, everyone knows that that's negative punishment, that what she's talking about. But since she obviously tells people to ignore, to do that, and we don't want her to be using punishment, suddenly that behavior is called negative reinforcement, which is, it's just, this isn't an argument, right? It's, this is nothing to argue. She's doing things like this through her whole presentation. Um, and then she starts presenting studies. She's presenting all these studies as proof at the end that punishment in any punishment used in any way in dog training is basically detrimental and bad. And the first study that she goes over is just, it's an old study from 20 years ago. And I can, I have the links to the studies. You can look them up. You can, you can read them. The first study was based off of um, dogs that in the study were being trained very, very harshly and um, being trained very harshly for, what is it, for like IPO training by, by dogs that were clearly being mishandled. And then these same handlers that were clearly mishandling the dog when you read it, did not know what they're doing. They also then gave these trainers um, electric collars where they were clearly doing all the poor techniques that they were doing without any training tools on the electric collar. And then what they did is they measured the stress signals from the dog. And because these trainers that were already handling the dogs harshly by all standards, um, and you now gave them an e-collar and they're blasting the dog at the highest level with no kind of like, structure to it whatsoever that any professional trainer that went through any sort of real vocational course with many of the there's there's so many different routes a trainer can go now to learn how to use tools the right way they use this extreme example of extreme harsh trainers and just showed there's more stress signals if you give crappy trainers a device that they don't know how to how to use and that was her first piece of proof that punishment and electric collars was bad in dog training. But what's also interesting um, is if you look at these charts, um, licking lips by shock dogs, they're an obedient. These are based off of, I believe, like seven minute training sessions where they said, you know, the dogs that during the obedience work, they were showing how stressed they were by how much they were doing like tongue flicks like twice in the park and, you know, and three times on the training grounds. And there was all these statistics, which was mostly had to deal with the ear position where they were measuring the ear positions and they were measuring how many times the tongue, the dog was flicking its tongue, which were signs of stress. Now, um, if you go to her own, in this same webinar, she is recommending the use of a gentle leader. If you go to her own videos, um, her own videos, I'm going to do, I'm not going to play this whole thing, but you can go to her own website. My, I posted it here for the sake of doing You need to do it sitting down if necessary. We're sitting down for ease of seeing the dog now. But, but if your dog is calmer with you sitting down, sit if down. If you Look. watch her and her training, Breath. Perfect. you can count the Come same on. amount of stress signals. Look. Good boy. There are more stress signals from her own training that they're using as proof that these dogs are very stressed in, in the study. And then when she puts on a gentle leader, which supposedly is not punishment, is not considered punishment or is not aversive. Hello, boy. So watch as she put puts this thing on. on. So this is already fitted for him. So it slips right around his nose. And then I just buckle it very tightly on the back. This is a deliberately snug fit. 
and it's important that it's snug because you want to miss all the major vessels. There's no pressure on his neck, which is good because if you put pressure on his neck, notice how he begins to gag and choke. That's because when he was hung by the choke chain, all of the... What she's doing, she's talking about how bad choke chains are and this dog was, but in the meantime, all this six minute video you can uh, easily close the six minute video as she's demonstrating this is obviously what would be considered a tool that's used for punishment and is used for negative reinforcement it is obviously aversive the dog's ear let me see matter of fact every i put a six minute clip because everywhere where you see a dog with one of these on their ear positions match or are worse than the worst case scenario in the video where the dogs are being trained by the harsh the harsh trainers the dog ducking down right now she's just manipulating the dog but you can see when um, all these dogs all their ears are back all the dogs are showing stress signals and she goes on talking about how you step on the leash to pull their head down if they're looking at you in the face and and it's just six minutes of of stress videos but the point is it's it's her first proof of why punishment is bad is that harsh trainers if you also give them electric collar there's going to be slightly more stress signals than if they were just jerking around the dog on whatever else they were using at the time but it also matches what you happen to see in her training video with also an aversive collar which she which she does not say she she does not put that it um volunteer that information that gentle leaders are actual punishment and if you put a gentle leader on one of these trainers that are training harshly you would get at least as bad results. And this is just a fact, right? You can, you can see it. This isn't something that really needs to be, that really needs to be, to be argued. Now, a bit about the gentle leader, I did put, where did I put it? Somewhere in all this, um, I have a, I have a, um, a link to an article when the gentle leader first came out. Oh, here it goes. I have a link over here. Um, ugh, this is making me dumb. All right. The login or something to the, to the article. But when I first started, when I was working in animal hospitals in the nineties, the gentle leader was patented. It was patented by a veterinary behaviorist and it was marketed to veterinary hospitals. Both the veterinary hospitals that I worked in had a display with these things on it. And it was never, ever marketed in the beginning as like not a punishment device. It was actually opposite. You can see in the, let me see, from the inventor itself and the articles, and it was called power steering and fingertip control, mimics a pack leader putting its mouth around the mouth of the other dog, applying pressure to the top of the nose to show dominance. This is from the inventor. And you can hear her saying the same thing. You can hear anywhere where this thing is marketed that it is clearly an aversive device. It has never, ever changed. The only thing that has changed is the community, the force-free community, Karen overall, it's being approved. The, the, the veterinary behaviors community has no accountability and they've been telling everyone it's even in the Merck manual, the thing is not described as a punishment device. Even in the Merck veterinary manual handbook for veterinarians, where it says where to send your, your clients for training, it says don't send them anywhere that we're gonna use punishment, but send them to someone who could use, will use a gentle leader, which is punishment. It is complete fraud, right? This is not an argument, it is. We're talking, don't waste your time arguing with this stuff. It is just complete fraud. I went over this. I did a whole video on this a while ago about fraud. I mean, Karen overall, you can apply the same thing to Karen Pryor, all right? This is, you know, about being force-free, only positive reinforcement, 100% positive reinforcement, all in the marketing for a competitive edge. It's 
it is definitely just fraud, right? It is, it is fraud. They're taking a device, which is punishment, and they are using them on dogs, doing scientific studies and saying this device, which is more aversive than the other collars by itself, if the dog's just standing in it, they're restrained more and saying that is purely, that is, that is training only with positive reinforcement versus other tools, which are do the same exact thing, but no one's trying to cover it up, right? If someone has a prong collar, it has prongs, it's a collar, it's a prong collar. If you have an e-collar, it's electric, it's a collar, it's an electric collar. But a, 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 a collar that constricts the nose and twists the head, instead of being a neck twisting collar, it's a gentle leader, right? This would be like calling, a, it's just called a prong collar, a gentle necklace or something, all right? And then suddenly now, it's no longer what it really is, what science says it is. Um, so for me, as a career school teacher, let me go back to my, me as a career school teacher in a school where I'm teaching students and I'm trying to be ethical and I'm teaching them operant conditioning and classical conditioning and I need to test them, like what is happening over here when someone applies pressure on this type of collar? What is it classified? I teach them all these things. And you gotta imagine these, the, the young trainers that want to pursue animal training as a career, there is gonna hit a point where in order for them to be able to get certified in the way that the veterinary community wants them to get certified, they are gonna to have to admit to the equivalent of saying the earth is flat. It's like going to high school and learning the right thing in high school, and then as they move further along in their career, they're gonna to have to, if they were going for geography or geology, at some point they're gonna, in order to, to get there, to be able to land that job, they're gonna say, all right, the earth is flat and Europe is not really a continent and I guess Australia is not a, con a continent anymore be <laughs> because they use different, you know, it's, it's your, your, it is not right what is going on. It is not right what's going on, it's holding, professional it is it is doing a very wrong thing to professionals that want to be ethical do not want to lie about what they're doing and in order to not be rejected um, in the professional circles they're forcing them to lie and to send people um, you know to send people to these veterinary behaviors basically um, I don't want to waste too much time with this either but this is just uh, to prove a point that it's just for some credit so I don't have to prove myself is is I am not against different types of training call this was a video 13 years ago I've been using you know there's a dog here with like a, a head halter there's one with uh with a no pull harness and then there's a dog that's being walked around with a if I move it along with a with a prong collar and then an electric collar. It's being moved around with, with an electric collar. And back in 13 years ago, we're still getting attacked um, by force-free community back then, unnecessarily, um, is I was using these things. I'll still use everything. A lot of trainers will, stu will still use everything. The only difference is, is I'm not just gonna use the tools and say that, that Veterinary behaviors, the only ones that the veterinary behaviors have been using that they patented and trying to eliminate com um, co competition. And you can see even, I mean, this is, there's, I'm sure hundreds of trainers who could post videos of their dogs wagging their tails with electric collars on looking exactly the same way as the dogs with other tools. And the tools are all being used for the same purpose, just different ways to do it that were all chosen for different reasons with each dog for the benefit of the dog and for the client, right? Not because we just want to cause pain to the dog. Not There are re real reasons why trainers, right, do not just want to use halty collars. It can be that. It, it can... They can't open their mouth. You may need to do something with their mouth. Some dogs don't like it. There's, it it's, it's, it's really not an argument. Um, 
um, when it comes to gentle leaders and halties, I have, I have, I think I have the most popular playlist on YouTube for using um, halty and gentle leader collars. But yet still, just to, to show that this is not an argument, um, of course people get good experience. I'm pulling from my comments. I'm not going to read these, but I get a lot of comments about traumatizing experience that people had by trying halty style and gentle leader collars where the dogs are, are panicked, they flip out, they rub their face on the floor, they're bleeding, they try to bite them. These are all comments from my own videos. And I believe that I show how to use these just as humane as anyone that uses these. These are aversive collars that are used for the same purposes as everything else that are being used to fool the veterinary community and the, the public. Now, the other thing, just talking about Karen overall, huge violations over here. You think she would know better. In her own literature, she's saying the gentle leader is good for dogs that have cervical neck damage involving disc bones, nerves, or muscles. Yet anyone else in the whole community um, pretty much agrees that that's the worst thing. That's the worst tool to put on a to put on, on a dog that has cervical neck injuries. Um, not only is it generally safe, but this pressure is the exact kind of signal dogs communicate to other dogs when they wish to control them to stop. Stop is punishment, right? In her own literature, she doesn't. It is basically confirming that it's a punishment device, and also she's misrepresenting about she wants to make sure that it's considered like gentle and safe which it takes is just as much care as any other training collar to do it the right way. Any inexperienced person, even children, could just put, the, put this on a dog and just walk it. All right, that's what she's saying. The most common complaint is that some loose lip dogs bite their, bite their lips. Not that they flip out and like make themselves bloody and all that kind of stuff. She's saying they're not cruel, cruel or humane. Yet, and, her, and she's saying to put dogs, it's okay to put a dog on a 50 foot light line on a head halter to do recalls and to, and to tug it. No, not at all mentioning that this is potentially very dangerous to the, um, to, to the, to the, the dog, the servo, that there's might not, that there is safer things that you can do than to have a dog run around on a 50 foot um, long line on a head collar. Now, from her own literature, I'm just showing that there's bias, professional bias towards anyone to do it. Everything, anything that she writes in her literature, her professional literature is doing nothing but saying prong collars do incredible damage, that they get embedded in the, in the skin, and that these collars, if sharpened, as is often the case, also intend to employ pain and encourage the dog to attend to the person like this is not an argument either i've been in this field for 30 years it is not common for people to sharpen prong collars it is common for people to to favor the prong collars that have rounded edges so they do who wants to deal with a medical issue when they're training their dog it is just false and we're not even go into she talks about how the dog's dominantly aggressive, the response can get worse, but yet in other parts of her literature, that's a whole different subject that dominance isn't something important that you should worry about, all right? So it just goes on and on. Shock, shock collars. No dog should wear a shock collar to correct an inappropriate behavior except on the qualified recommendation of a specialized in behavioral medicine. So no one should ever go to a trainer that uses these in her professional um, unless it is recommended by her and then basically says, but no one's ever going to recommend it um, at all. So if you're a balanced trainer and you use remote collars because there are because of the real uses and benefits that we know they have, she's not telling the veterinary community this. All right. It's just there's no use for it. And if you ever are going to use it. She has to tell you and her community has, has, to, has to tell you. Now, just to put a little bit in contrast, the shows this is not the norm. This is 
This is, um, if you go into the handbook of applied behavior and training by Stephen Lindsay, I mean, there's three different volumes and I'm not sure which volumes these are all from, but I collected them from. This is by far the most well-referenced and objective book on dog training that has science, that is, that objectively refers to scientific literature. If you, if you read his description of prong collar, e-collar, head collar, right, it's, they're all on equal. Everything has pros and cons. Everything can be used safely. Everything can be used the wrong way. I'm not going to read all this, but this is really the norm. Like this is the real information. And if she has not formally trained on how to use an e-collar or a prong collar, she has no business falsely mi misrepresenting it. What is her source? What is her source to put this information out there? Um, next thing, she goes into a study number, to study... A second study, which most people are familiar with this study, and uh, not to go into too much details, but it's that study that a lot of people know is, it was a group of, of beagles. There's three sets of beagles. One set of beagles was shocked on high levels randomly, and they showed high cortisol stress levels. And every trainer would agree upon that, right? And this is something that people just do not even do, all right? So it could be agreed upon that this is not something professional trainers are telling people to do. Then there's another set of beagles where they're just given commands without any pre-training, without the dog understanding what to do. It's the equivalent of random shocks, like just telling the dog come with no escape with none of the pre-training that any professional trainer would do, even if someone wasn't a professional trainer, what any, um, what any instructional manual would even tell you to do, just saying commands and just pressing a button, no way a dog would understand what is going on, showing those dogs get stressed out. Then in the study, it shows um, for chasing, I think it was an electric rabbit or something, that if it was well-timed and the dog associated it, um, not only did using electric collars for off to stop dogs from doing things off leash worked really well, there were no signs clinically or by looking at the dog that there were any sort of ongoing stress. You know, it was bad in the moment. It was predictable. If the dog understood it, it worked. It was able to stop behavior and there was no bad long-term effects from it. Something we don't need to argue about. Something we know can only be done with punishment, all right? Punishment's the break. Reinforcement is the gas pedal, all right? They're, they're two different things. We're not going to use a car gas pedal to stop. We can't, we, we can't say that we can stop the behavior better with positive reinforcement. We could teach a new behavior, but we can't stop it. But anyway, she uses this somehow as proof Somehow she twists it to say this is proof again that we should not, no one should use electric collars. The study proves used correctly, it is very effective and doesn't show any kind of stress. And she completely tosses out the science. And she's like, even though they say that, that doesn't happen in real life. That's basically what she said. So she goes against the conclusions that, um, you know, yes, poor timing and randomness is bad, but used correctly, it is good, all right? That it is good. Then she goes on to a third study, um, which I don't know even where to begin with this one. Efficacy of dog training with and without remote electric co collars versus a focus on, on positive reinforcement. I, I, I played around with with uh with just turn it into a fairy tale it's you would think the way it's presented what you would think is happening is oh this is we could talk for two hours just on this i'm gonna try to try to make this brief it's supposed to be proof to the veterinarians that are not reading this that they're leading you to believe that there was a group of dog that they had these people that complain that they're Chief complaint, dogs off leash, chasing after livestock, um, showing aggression off leash over other dogs, off leash control problems. And the claim, which they're trying, which they're, which is, they miss, what she's doing is trying to mislead us 
that this one study proves, proves without a shadow of a doubt, that if you train a dog only with positive reinforcement, you can get equal, at least equal and even or better results than if you were using positive reinforcement and punishment. And because of that, it is, it's, it seals the deal that there's no use at all for, because people could use them incorrectly like any other tool and they could cause stress. And there's no proof in science that, that it works better than just using positive reinforcement that there's no rational reason to use electric collars or even punishment for that matter. It's not just electric collar, pun even, even punishment. Um, but when you dig through this study, which you, oh, oh God, this study, this one was, it was pulled out of a, you could first find the thesis um, from uh, China. What's her first name? I don't know. Um, was it Lucy China? I don't remember. Last name China, the, the researcher. It was pulled out of her thesis. In the thesis, her purpose of the study, it said, basically to help ban electric cars. This is a study. It wasn't let's do an objective study. There's nothing, when you go through it, nothing in the form of, um, there's, there's nothing scientific about it. There's no scientific method whatsoever in this. Nothing is controlled at all in this study. Nothing. Um, um, the dogs are trained in different places. You all have different collars on by different trainers. It is not a controlled study at all. Um, in, peer, in peer review, this study is torn to pieces in peer review because they always want to talk about, oh, these are peer reviewed. Even in peer review, if you look up this study, I don't have to, I don't have to go into the details. It's just torn apart. What it said it's supposed to prove in no way proves. Matter of fact, even in peer review, they said if you just look at the bad data to begin with in a different way, for instance, um, here we go. Like if you like they say it is better because oh, here's training with how close, you know, how close how quickly a dog responded to the to the come command, you know, over three days because the average of the time over three days was quicker with only positive reinforcement. Therefore, it is better than using an e-collar or using an e-collar, you know, and positive reinforcement. However, if you just look at it differently, the dogs got faster by the end of the training versus slower, you know, faster with aversives, even though the kicker is there was, there was never a positive reinforcement being um, tested to begin with. We, you know, we get, we get to that part. Um, but anyway, if, if you look at the data, there's, there's nothing proven at all. It's just bias there. They did two rounds at this. There, there was, uh, there was this, there was this experiment that was set up by people that were biased and they tried to crunch the numbers twice, like separated by, I don't know, like eight years or so. I don't, I don't even know to try to prove that somehow positive reinforcement is better. But now here, here's the kicker. This is the part that's super criminal. First, I mean, this, there's so much, there's so much information. You don't even know where to start. I looked up the original study who was doing it and they have to write that there's no conflict of interest. Like I looked up, um, you know, this was recrunching the data from the original, you know, study and the videos of the dogs in the study. I'm looking the people up and I'm like, all right, I look, the first one I look up, Hannah Wright, She's a member of the American Pet Dog Trainers Association, like one of the researchers. The research is trainers in the American Pet Dog Trainers Association. It says that in the study, basically versus other trainers that use aversives. And guess who's going to be the better trainer? All right. The American Pet Dog Trainers trainers. Guess who's on the research team? Someone who's a member of the American 
<laughs> the member of, of the APD. Guess who else is on it? Someone who is, uh, I mean, you, you can't make this stuff up. Someone who's on Victoria Stillwell Academy's advisory board member. Like, um, but anyway, and you really have to, um, there's, there's, I'm not going to go into everything because it's, it's, it's very re, um, redundant, but I'm going to skip all the way down over here and maybe jump back up. There's a really great podcast um, for, with Ivan Balabanov and Michael Ellis. And it's, it's long. It's after, oh, it's like three hours. It's somewhere, yeah, when you start getting to like the one minute 15 or 17. After I was researching this, I was listening to this podcast and I was already putting this together and I was like, what a gift <laughs> from Ivan. He happened to be talking about the same thing and somehow he has video footage of the training, which no one has access to. And the dogs in the study that are being trained with positive reinforcement, they have they have gentle leaders on. <laughs> They have gentle leaders on, and these rep and these represent in the study the dogs that are saying, um, "Let me see." Or you, they're saying that they're using only positive reinforcement in the study, and the way they're judging these dogs is it's supposed to prove um, for off-leash training, off-leash control of dogs around livestock, which one's better? The stud, all as the study shows, the videos that they were evaluating were like a few sheep in a playpen that weren't even moving, dogs on like a very short leash being, being trained. Nothing was ever tested off leash to test which was more effective in the area that was supposed to be, be, be tested. And matter of fact, even these dogs in the halt, in the gentle leaders, how could they even turn around? And I'm trying to find a clip from, to show the dog in, yeah. Um, let's see. These are the dogs that, there's no punishment used in the training. They're trying to put an e-collar to prove that it was controlled. So the people evaluating the footage don't know which dogs are trained with e-collar and which one's trained in positive reinforcement. But how could whoever's, it has to be biased. There's no way that's controlled or blind because how do the people evaluating the footage not notice gentle leaders on the dogs? How do they not notice the people who are using the e-collars are actually you know, holding a remote too? It's just, it's just, really, it's just really silly. Um, but this right here is a great, I, I put this over here, training without conflict podcast, episode seven, Michael Ellis and Ivan Balabanov. Um, it's, it's, I mean, the whole thing is, is brilliant. The conversation, which is the sort of conversation that I was hoping I would be able to get, um, doing a webinar with. Karen overall, but instead, if you compare and contrast, um, Michael Ellis, Ivan both have schools, vocational schools, and people learn how to do um, honest training. And to be truthful, in order for them to ever be recommended by a veterinarian or any of their students, and this should make professional trainers very angry, they would have to not use the tools that they know how to use that can do things um, better and more humanely in certain situations for certain dogs. And they would have to agree when they take certification tests, the certification tests that you need to be recommended by veterinarians you would have to agree to the equivalent, like I said, of the earth is flat and yeah, gentle leaders are not punishment. And 
you would have to agree to the things that are going to help work for their marketing, right? You're agreeing, you're you're agreeing to be there to 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 just help with this commercialized, self-fulfilling thing, conflict of interest thing that is that is going on. Um so oh. So I wanted to put this information out there and I feel like I can go like line by line and post all this stuff that she's saying. I have recorded the webinar with Karen overall um, in case I need it for like any legal reasons. I'm personally going to file a formal complaint because I pay to go to that webinar and I'm being given definitely false information. And she's also telling me and everyone else that people like me are incompetent and are gonna get animals killed. And it's not even, it's not even an argument. It's nothing that you need to really prove. Like you shouldn't have to prove it on a professional setting. It's, it's a legal issue at this point. It's really a legal issue. It's it's gone too far. This has already happened in other countries. I mean, if you're listening from another country, you already know. And here's the other thing is um, there are a lot of force-free dog trainers that do not know that they are not really force-free. They do not even know because they're not, they are discouraged. They get kicked out of their professional circles if they even, we've seen it, if they even, communicate with trainers that have been doing it for decades and have a lot of good information to give and are doing things humanely and have no problem training their dog in public, in front of everybody, without hiding anything. In contrast, it is these force-free trainers that are hiding, right? They cannot, they will not train even, it's at the point where there are so many lies, you, I don't even know how Ivan got that footage. They would not even be able to show that footage and anyone take it serious and say that was proof that these dogs um, listen better off leash around, around all these distractions. The proof was after they did that, completely, I'm not gonna go into, it's too, it's, it's too many details this would be too long. Um, there's no need to go into the details because it could always be proven, easily proven, that the dogs were never tested to see which one is better in those situations. And you would not even have to prove it because it doesn't even make sense. From a theoretical science point of view, it doesn't even make sense what they're claiming is happening, is actually happened. And they got their results by biased, you know, they let, you don't, none of this information is in the study. It gets, you find it in bits and pieces from, from different places where even the dogs and nothing was controlled. The, the owners of the dogs got to decide if they wanted the dog to be trained one way or the other. If they did not like e-collars, they could prove their dog, they can have their dog trained by the positive reinforcement people. And then they based it on surveys that said how satisfied they were with the training. Never were the dogs ever um, tested off leash, um, off leash control in these situations that it was supposed to prove that this was better than that. And not only that, the, the, the um, regurgitation of the study didn't even include surveys of the owners after the dog went home. This one, the proof that the dogs did better was during the training process, it was they were looking at the dogs day one, they're recording and the dog isn't even trained yet. The results are based off, oh, did the dog respond to the first command? And those who are using mostly positive reinforcement that they, they used five times as amount of words in 15 minute sessions, which were obviously just had the dog on, on halties and were just giving them treats probably already came knowing what sit means, knowing what come means. There was nothing to even teach them they were basing it off how quickly the dogs were just obeying on a short leash that they cannot even turn their head to face the sheep if they wanted to, and they couldn't do it anyway. And that was proof that these dogs are now trained off. I mean, it would be 
so great if it was that easy. If you read these studies, like it was based off of like five days, two 15 minute sessions. And supposedly just with treats, the dogs now have good results where they're not running after livestock, not charging after other dogs, that all these things it's fixed. It's, it's a fairy tale. It is nothing more than a fairy tale. And the problem is, is there's no accountability and laws are happening because of these things. Um, owners of dogs are suffering. They, dogs are not having the same amount of freedom. They're not, they don't have quality of life. It is not about the dog or even the owner anymore. It is 100% for selfish reasons why this stuff is happening with at least the people who should know better. I know there's a lot of people that don't know better that are brainwashed and it makes sense that they're brainwashed. How would they not be brainwashed if they are trusting people to give them information that are supposedly the authorities on this stuff and it is worst information and less factual than students are getting in high school. It's just, it's a shame. Um, so if for some reason Karen Overall ever watches this, uh, shame on you, you're a fraud. I hope you come try to sue me or something. <laughs> you're a joke, you're an embarrassment um, from someone as part of the veterinary community, as a teacher, as a father, as, as, as a decent human being, as a veteran, is you are shameful, you're despicable.